Welcome to Real Money Talks. Real strategies from the money makers and the world changers that you can use to make millions, keep those millions, multiply your wealth, and build your team. Here's your host, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View, Laurel Langmire. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Laurel's Weekly Market Awareness Broadcast. Happy to have you all here. Going to go live on the social platforms in just a moment. But as always, if you are with us live, you are able to chat and interact with us using both the Q&A box and the chat box through the Zoom platform here. Our experts will be happy to answer questions throughout the conversation day, and we'd love to hear what your thoughts are during this time. Have a number of guests within the community on today, so very excited to have everyone here. So, Laurel, I want to see how we're doing today, ma'am. How are we going on? We're good. We're good. So, uh, again, we're heading into December. I cannot believe uh, this year is going to end the way that this year did, but it is what it is. Thomas and I and a few others on our team are going to get together and really schedule what we do every year. It's called New Year, New You. And we will put a completion time to December. Those of you in the big table, uh, December 16th is an all-day 10 to 6 event, and that'll be the completing. Then on January 5th will be our new year, new you, and January 6th, big table, folks. So we're going to put them right back to back, complete 2020, and whatever that's all going to mean. I think the biggest thing, as I'm talking to a lot of my mentors, because that's one of our themes today, like where are the big points that we got to talk about? And this is a heck of a write-off year. You know, what's interesting, it's like uh, this year didn't exist. You know, my son plays for the NCAA, and all of the athletes, uh, any sport in the NCAA, they're on scholarship, doesn't count. It's not a red shirt year. It's not a playing year. It gives everybody an extended year. So I always say, you know, it's sort of like a delete, um, although, although we really can't just delete it. <laughs> we have to kind of deal with some things. So tax structure is a big one. Scott said after, uh, I think it was yesterday's call, and Thomas remember to bring it up again on um on our laser call today at four, Scott got blown up. Finally, I think people got the memo. Uh, they need to get incorporated. So that is at minimum. And then, you know, as Eileen then will tell you is with your corporation, you get corporate credit and we can help you get funding as we head into probably another stimulus package on 2021. It is probably the most critical thing you do. In addition to that, we are going to talk about cryptocurrency and digital currency. It uh, 2020 moved it to the forefront extremely quick. We'll be talking about that. So we have two big themes today. And Chris Klein is with us, um, who is our digital currency Bitcoin expert, called me last week and said, you know, we got to stay relevant and I got to tell them what's going on. And so we're going to talk about that from our marketplace awareness. And then we've had a lot of questions uh, in our Ask Laurel and our chats, our millionaires in training about not only why get a money mentor, why have mentors? And so as long as you can stay on, Chris, we're going to have that conversation. I've had mentors every year since I was 17. You know, and mentors come in a lot of forms. So I'll speak a little bit about how I have mine. Thomas knows we're reaching back out to one of the greatest men I've mentored, which is Dan Kennedy, who did not pass. But he actually sent me a personal letter and said, uh, how about 2021? We go again. I love those years with that man. So we have two, two topics. So let's back up and talk about digital currency. Um, Chris, what would you say 2020 I'm assuming you all know Chris Klein. Chris Klein, why don't you uh, tell them a little bit about yourself? But I want you to answer the question, like, what did 2020 do for digital currency? For me, I don't like how many years did it move it to the forefront? I mean, one year, two years, 10 years. It's been here, but it's going to be a normal currency very, very quick, if not already. Yeah. I would actually venture to say that it was the ultimate test for digital currency. This was the time where you have chaos in the marketplaces, concerns about printing of U.S. dollars, People can't use banks regularly. Money, as it's as we know it, is manifesting itself into a new derivative. And if we didn't step up to the plate as digital currency guys this year, we could have been an afterthought because this was the time to rise to the occasion. So though you say it's an alt control delete of 2020 for taxes and other things, I'd like to keep this year on the books for digital currency if you're okay with that. <laughs> And again, tell us a little bit more about what occurred to move it so quickly. I mean, we started the year, it was in the three to four thousands. We're at 18, headed towards, you know, north of 20. Talk a little bit about the projections. Yeah. And if you're okay with it, I have just some charts to visualize it. So as I talk a little bit, you guys, I know people are 90% visual. So I'll just do a little share so that we have them to work off of, because those are great questions, uh, Laurel, that you bring to the forefront. So let me just really quickly share my screen. The first thing you asked about was what you talked about was this 
what has happened to it. And so I actually pulled from my data charts something that I snippeted uh, a couple of days ago. This is since Bitcoin really had its first big bang in 17. So you can see the left side of the chart, not a lot of activity going on. Uh, crypto was really, really not known at all. It was just one of those things that people were playing with. And some guy bought Bitcoin with uh, pizza with Bitcoin, and now it's the world's most expensive pizza ever bought. Uh, and you see this just exponential rise that happened towards the tail end of 17 right now, basically what, where we're at right now, as far as time of year. And it just went haywire. And it was mostly driven by retail FOMO. People were fearing of missing out. Is it going to keep going, keep going, keep going? And that caused a big fallout that you see. And ever since about March of 18, us crypto guys have been just sitting in this ebbs and flows, ups and downs. But what's really interesting is what you brought up in March is that everything tanked in March, right? Everything took a hit in March. Stocks, gold, Bitcoin, anything that you were in because everybody had this shock effect. And yeah. you can see that that was really the manifestation of this next rally that we've been enduring in crypto so far this year. It's interesting when you think of uh, levels and if history repeats itself or rhymes, yes, what goes up comes down, but uh, it's got a lot of, I think 2020, if there was a word for crypto is maturing. It had a chance to rise to the occasion, it matured. And what was driving it? Well, first, well, there's there's kind of four big things. First is bond yields went to nowhere. If you were a typical investor putting money aside into a bond, you were getting either at near zero or negative rates compared to inflation. So it was useless. It was really kind of a, you say it best all the time, Laurel, is money that's sitting around is dying. Lazy, lazy assets, right? Yep, lazy assets. At the same time, and what drove that is we started printing money at an exponential rate. Over the years, you know, we've had QE since 2006 after the fallout of the recession. And people talked about, oh, we're printing so much money, so much money. Well, now we're printing money like we've never printed money before. It's like a new fad, like how much money can you print? And actually, I just saw a great article yesterday about uh, London and the UK. For the first time ever, their national debt will exceed $2 trillion. So it's not just us. This isn't just United States monetary supply. This is all money that's out there, uh, fiat currency, as we call it. You couple those two pieces with the pandemic. The coronavirus was definitely a, a time to, for us to shine and a time that was is going to change the way that the economy works, whether we like it or not. It's a reality. Even before we were at national debt rates that were at, at the level of almost World War II. And remember, we were fighting Nazis, the Japanese. We were trying to survive liberty, life in pursuit of happiness. We didn't care what it cost to build tanks and those things. That was a time where we had to put bullets in, in places so that we could, we could save freedom. Can we do that again today? You know, I, I don't know. It's a different we'll, world. We'll keep it in the United States. And even internally, now we've got this stimulus one, probably two, three, four. We've got a new Democratic president coming in. They tax and spend. So we know it's not going anywhere. So you put all that together. And then the last piece that just started happening in the last, say, 90 days is that major players are coming in to mature us. First was the this little company called Square that does payments. They made enough money that they had $50 million sitting on their balance sheet. And they decided instead of keeping it in lazy assets, they put it to work in Bitcoin. And they have now made more money by that Bitcoin investment 90 yeah. days ago than they made all year as a business. And more and more are jumping on the bandwagon and doing that. The biggest was PayPal announcing users have access to trade, buy, sell cryptocurrency in the PayPal platform. Awesome. Awesome addition. Cash App did it a few about six, seven months ago. They added it in. Now these guys that are these new platforms are literally buying more Bitcoin than is being made. So Bitcoin is mined in a process kind of like if you think of digital mining, like digging in the hole to get a piece of gold out. You've got to dig deeper and deeper and deeper as the gold goes away. Same concept with Bitcoin. Uh, and as it's coming out, it's being created. There's such a high demand. So, I mean, basic economics, everybody knows the supply and demand curves. If supply shrinks and demand's going off the roof, you've got a perfect recipe. We call it the perfect storm for crypto this year. So comparative to what's happening on the left, which is we're printing money, we're trying to figure out how to get through Corona, we're shutting down all restaurants in Los Angeles again as of today, they're just crippling industries, these major effects while we're just printing money fancy free versus an asset like gold, but actually even more finite, that is a scarcity, lowers inflation, and really is a lot of folks looking at it as like a hedge against what could be the effect of all this printing of US dollars and things. Yep. What you said earlier to Laurel about 2020 is going to change the way we look at things. I think it's going to change the way we look at what is money and what do we consider money to be and how does it pertain its value. And that's all becoming relative to a lot of different assets now. It used to just be, well, at one point, gold was king, cash was king, cotton was king. It's always some kind of asset that that is king. Now there's kind of a lot of relative competition in the space. Uh, and you look at uh, just kind of some of the things that make money what it is. Can we move it easily? Uh, is it divisible? 
Is it durable? Uh, you look at, there's no change. You go everywhere nowadays and they say you got to pay with the exact change. Or I think I saw CVS was rounding up every bill now to, yeah. to make it so it's even. With Bitcoin, you have 11 decimal points of disability, divisibility. So we haven't even gotten into the yeah. surface of understanding how to use these things. Uh, and that's where why it stands at this, uh, I, I guess, on this pedestal with other currencies today, which is a big change from just a year ago uh, when people thought crypto had its day in, in the sunshine and was over. The attributes of what makes uh, money money is really coming to fruition this year. So, Chris, what do people do today? Right. I mean, we're at 18,000. Uh, I don't know anybody that I've talked to sees uh, like I think is this the new norm? I hear a lot of people say, "Well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till it goes back down." I think that's a big question in the community. What should I do today? And talk a little bit of how they can do that with you, especially once they're in coaching. I mean, a lot of you are wandering around. You're not really in our money coaching process, so you don't have a real plan. And you're doing what would you call it? Uh, any of you can uh, speak to it. It's sort of like you're taking the little crumbs that we talk about and you're trying to build a pie, and you don't have the right ingredients because you don't have the complete formula. Mm -hmm. So I always, I always risk asking, you know, kind of an advice question or what to do question, because obviously for all of you, it's in the context of your larger plan for those of you that are with us, but just as it is a general huge question out in our millionaires and training group. Yeah. And it's everywhere. They're not alone. A lot of people are wondering, okay, is, is it going to hit 20 and fall back or is it going to skyrocket from there? And you could probably read an article that could tell you either thing at any time. Yeah. The thing that I, I think a lot of the members in the community have learned that have gotten themselves in order and gotten crypto like you exposed is positioning. If the thing drops a thousand dollars and that's your day to buy in, if your money's not where it needs to be inside of an entity or inside of a self-directed IRA and prepared to execute a trade, you've missed out on that opportunity. So a lot of times, folks, this isn't like other assets where they'll drop and then you have a few weeks or otherwise to jump in. It's momentarily. It could drop and then be back before you even like you think about doing it. And then you don't and then you don't do it for five minutes and you go back and it's already changed. Uh, and so because of the speed at which the asset moves, positioning is critical. Um, if you're not in position and the nice part is uh, most of the other things that they're experts in the community, uh, like the things that Randy and Kelly do at iFlip and some of the yeah. real estate for a transact, they're all eligible inside the exact same self-directed IRA account. So if you get yourself in a place where you've got it where you need to be, then you can make the decisions that you're looking for. Because anybody that says they have a crystal ball this year, I would tell them to control alt delete. Uh, because there's certainly there's uh, yeah. even experts in the field. This is an unprecedented year. So that's a tough question to ask. But if you think crypto is going to be a part of the world for the next three, five, seven years or beyond, you're probably going to need some of it. There's this kind of this thing that people say of getting off zero. I, I own zero Bitcoin today. I want to own something by tomorrow and and slowly accumulate over time or position yourself for a larger purchase and then a, a hold, whatever your strategy might be. And so, Chris, uh, there's different kinds of coins. Is Bitcoin really the one they start with? Should they do Ethereum? Should they ripple? Should they do? I mean, we're working on a very private, which, you know, going to say rivals talent. It's talent Joe, right? Which is our, you know, America's got talent, which will then have a coin associated. And there's going to be a lot of businesses, as you know, you know, in real estate right now, you can buy and do transactions, not only in the blockchain, but even further in a hash graph. I mean, there's so much people don't even have a clue about, but in the basics, where, where would they be looking in the beginning for those that are just kind of scratching the surface? I think everybody starts with Bitcoin. I, I don't, I mean, unless you're kind of, we have clients that are like nerds that come in and they have a particular coin or a particular blockchain that they're really passionate about, then they go that direction. But Bitcoin is probably in 85% of portfolios in our platform. It's, 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 it's a kind of a staple. Uh, and then you have the big three other than that, that are having some pretty awesome uh, months as well. Ethereum, uh, which is, it's going through a protocol change next month which is going to fix uh, choke points, speed issues. If you want to think of Ethereum, it's like uh, it's for contracts is what my daughter says, but it's really like internet for apps. So the internet exists and then we have all these websites that run on top of it, right? Ethereum exists and all these, what they call dynamic apps or apps are running on top of it. And so it's the infrastructure of a whole new generation of what you mentioned, like bit, bit yeah. businesses, tokens, exchanges, all these things run off of those things. So that's a, that's a pretty solid one that lots of folks are looking at. Uh, Ripple has uh, sat at 20 cents for almost like a year and a half and then just skyrocketed to 60 cents this past week. What Ripple will do is it's supposed to move money between banks faster. Right now, we did this thing in Boise where we wanted to move money from somebody in Reno, Nevada to uh, Jace's thing where he was working in Uganda with the paintings. Yeah. And that. 
and the dollar moves slowly and it and it loses value by either fees or time slow the, ripple is designed to go into that system and speed those transactions up that's something that the folks are looking at so and then litecoin is it's kind of like gold to silver bitcoin to litecoin uh, it's got limited supply. There's going to be more of it, and it's faster and easier to mine. So you're seeing like, there's a, a Litecoin community that's signing up merchants. So when you, you'll start seeing when yeah. you go to the store or when you're online buying something that now buy with Litecoin is an option. Because a lot of people don't want to buy stuff with Bitcoin. I, I've got my grandfather's got gold bars that he left me. I'm not going to sell those things. I'll probably give them to my daughter and she'll give them to her daughter because, A, it's difficult, right? Like, where do I go sell this bar? Nobody's going to take a bar of gold for a TV. You're going to get ripped off, right? Uh, and so uh, that, that's where Litecoin comes in is some people take look at Bitcoin like they're gold. What's that? You can't, you can't take your bar of gold out to eat and they just chip away at it? You know, I mean, it makes that, fun because I think so many people, I don't even, I was on a call earlier today with somebody's like, well, I just, I just think I got to get into gold and silver. And I said, and, and then what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to spend it? Like there isn't that it's not transactable. Now, the only state that that's not true is in Utah. And, and I actually think, Texas and Ohio too. They, they accept it as tender for taxes. And once yeah. they take it as tender for taxes, then it's a considered actual money. That's, that's barterable of that type, but you're right. What's cool is we took gold in a different look on our platform recently because it needed liquidity, it needed fluidity to it. Yeah. Uh, and so what we did is we we got an inventory at the Royal Canadian Mint of big gold bars and smaller bars and smaller denominations. And we put a blockchain over the top of it so that clients could buy and sell their gold or swap it for Bitcoin or Ethereum oh, or real, cool. estate, real time 24-7. Uh, which I think is going to change the way that people look at gold. Because there may be, say that Bitcoin goes to 40, 50,000, let's just say. And you're like, okay, I got to step off a little bit. I take my profits. You know, people, you, everybody takes their profits at some point. And now do I want those profits in dollars? Or maybe do I just want them in gold because it's a pretty stable long-term asset. And I know that it won't have any disruptions to it because it's mostly universal. But do I want to take and put it all the way into dollars, then move it all the way over into gold bars, then store them somewhere, then have to do the reverse when I want to get out of my gold holdings? Or is there some kind of digital version that's available that I can have the exposure to real gold, but not the headache of owning gold? Yeah. Well, Chris, we're going to stay tuned throughout now to the end of the year. Uh, watch what things uh, happen as uh, week by week. We uh, actually still are deciding. I know you just said we're having a president. Uh, I'm hoping uh, R still stands. So we'll That's have the California to... effect out here. I know. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, it's... isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm, see, they're happy. Either way, I think. If it would have went the other way, I'd, I would have to, I'd have like, uh, we'd have boarded up buildings and riots and those things. So, you know, if the party that had to lose had to lose, at least it was the gentlemen and the ladies that walked away gracefully. Is we my, haven't my lost. one take on this election this year. We haven't lost yet. So we're going to continue on. Stay, stay tuned. Do you want to stay in? Uh, we're going to have a quick conversation. The rest about of about mentors. Yeah, I'd love to yeah. stay on. I have I have some interesting stories about mentors over the years. Well, and, and I know you're in a high end leadership group. I've been in high end mastermind groups, and I think the theme that we really want to um, you know convey to you. I mean, Thomas joined the table. When did you join the table, Thomas? He's probably the longest standing here. Twenty twelve. Yeah, twenty twelve. Um, you've seen Ken Starks be back from like. 2002 and three, um, yep. known Scott Arden that long. So when you think about the duration of, I'm just going to say relationships, mm -hmm. uh, because like to, to work together, to team together, you know, I think one of the biggest leadership things we teach and it gets, when you get into deal structure and deal making is when you really start experiencing it is like, I think a lot of people think, you know, they're going to become like my, you know, because I always say, come on, kids, that's my funny little thing I say. But the truth is, like, I have very few employees that actually work for me that I can tell what to do. Right. So we're in contractual relationships. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, as you step into being an entrepreneur, you don't know how to lead yourself. You're used to being told what to do or guided by a boss. Right. And the reason why mentors exist is because they kind of at some level take that role. I mean, I know I've taken that role for a lot of people who are transitioning from employee to entrepreneur and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to produce a revenue producing day. They don't know how to get up and where to go. And then they work at home. It's even worse because their home is where they hang out, eat, do laundry, do all sorts of other things, not work. Yeah. So when you think about being an entrepreneur, if you don't have mentors, I don't even know how you perform. And I was just blessed. I kind of walked into mentorship because I, you know, I just wanted to study money. And here's how my mentorship began before anybody told me I needed one. I was 17 years old. I had the book Think and Grow Rich. And I thought, well, this is like what I was going to commit my life and time to. Took a little break and did some fitness stuff. But for the most part, I always studied like how so few people figured out money. So I walked into a bank because, you know, at 17, I didn't know 
damn thing about money, but I knew that that's where money was stored. And I asked the bank president, I walked straight in my, well, I was in aerobics. I just got done with aerobics class. So here am I in my gym clothes looking like hell or like I just worked out. And I, I walked straight into a CEO, the, the owners actually at that point when he owned the bank. And I just said, I want you to mentor me. And he's like, well, who are you? I'll never forget how I got my first mentor because I still am friends with him today. because so we laugh about it. He said, you had no idea what you were going to ask him for. I said, I just knew I needed to ask somebody about money that knew about money and people put money in your bank. That's literally how simplistic I was. And so I want to know what people invest in. You hold their money. Where did they put it to work? I want to work in your investment firm. And he's like, aren't you cute? I said, I am. And I see you have been graduated college. Anyway, that was my first mentor. I don't think I really told the detail of that story about how raw it was. And he said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, I'm going to come with questions once a week. He said, I'll take you out to eat. And he said, you can't afford to take me out to eat. And I said, well, I don't care. We'll go to McDonald's. We just sit in your office. I just want to ask you questions. You answer them. And he said, you expect to like, you know, I said, I'll pay you. He said, I'm not going to pay you. Anyway, fast forward then I've had mentors forever because mentors jobs, unlike having that boss, I think are to guide you, avoid costly errors share their Rolodex, share their experience, and um, just provide guidance beyond anything that you can do. And then when you have masterminds together, it's almost like co-mentorship at a lot of levels. So what we've built in this community, um, and in, you know, I just created the structure for it, and amazing people showed up to help create what we have together. So I just want to talk. That was kind of my first. Maybe what we do is each of you go around. Who was your first mentor, and how did you – like mine, I just kind of stumbled into the bank and figured it out, and then obviously got much more sophisticated at selecting very intentional mentors. What, let's go around the room. So, Thomas, who was your first kind of mentor or group. And I, I want to, I'm sorry, I've had one more thing to this because I think a lot of people, this is why, like I know four people right now from last week's show who aren't going to buy into our community because they were burned in somebody else's. Mm. So, you know, what was the first program you bought or first experience? So let's just go around and each share. What was our first experience? Because sometimes they weren't all great. I paid a lot of money for people that were like, what the hell am I? That was a waste of money. Yeah. So, Yeah. Go ahead, Thomas. You want to use yeah, that? so I, I kind of did the mentorship thing from afar. Tim Ferriss in his four hour work week book was really instrumental in wanting to be an entrepreneur. Uh, but I never got involved working directly with Tim, never did anything like mentorship like that. And I'm kind of independent. So it's something I need to do to break out of my shell and make that happen. And I attended a three days to cash workshop in Chicago in 20, is either 2012 or 2013. Um, but that was the first time I went to an event, went to a seminar like that, made money like that drank from the fire hose like that and had everything happen that needed to be in one place. And it was one of those situations where it was like, I just met these people. This is the biggest ass kicking of an event I had ever done in my life, but I knew I needed to do more. And from that point on working with some of the folks on the team, like our our good friend, Eric Metcalf, some of the folks like Dallin, uh, Juan, Steve, you know, some of the other marketing folks on the team uh, were very influential. But just working with you for the past five years, I've had a chance to see a lot of what it is you do and learn a lot from a mentorship perspective. So in terms of what you want to see and what you want to do, you know, if you want to watch someone who flies a million miles an hour, manages over a hundred different companies, or I forgot how many you know it is right now or what it's been, um, this is the perfect opportunity because you realize that it can't be a situation where it's easy and it can't be like, you know, all friendly sometimes. I mean, it's, it's about work. You got to get stuff done. And, you know, and, you know, thankfully you, you've kept me honest. You've slapped me around a couple of times, but we've been able to get some stuff going and uh, I'm, I'm all the wiser for it. And I totally appreciate it. And just one last thing, especially in this community, not only mentors, but you also learn about like new markets in general, which I think is the most important thing. I never would have learned about Bitcoin and crypto in this community. Um, also real estate, specifically tax liens and tax deeds. I mean, just the fact you have that community, you can get involved with these deals and learn all about it is what I love so much about this group and being a part of it. Yep. Thank you. Eileen, what about you? On a recent call, I think on the event broadcast, you said you spent hundreds of thousands uh, as well. I did. My first mentor, and I didn't even realize it was a mentor at the time, was back in 1976 when I had my first job after high school. And I was in retail and she taught me everything possible. I wanted to be the best salesperson. I wanted to be the best manager. And she was the starting point for me to realize mentorship was important. So as I went through, I I never am shy about asking for help. If I don't know something, I'm going to research it or I'm going to find the people that can help me do what I want to do. But first, I had to be very clear on what I wanted. And for years, I wasn't. 
So I am a lifetime student of personal development because I would buy every program that was put out there. I would go and work with this coach and work with that coach. But what I learned along the way is that I wasn't clear on what, what mentorship I actually wanted. So when it came to money, because that's the arena I'm in now with all the credit pieces, I needed to find somebody that was intelligent about the money conversation. And so I started stalking Laurel years ago. She didn't know that I was stalking her, but I was getting involved in reading all the books. Anywhere that that Laurel was going to be, I was watching. She didn't know that at the time. And then we finally connected in 2018 because I decided I need this person in my life to help me understand how money really works, how I can invest it, how I can make it, because I was a spender. I made good money, but I, I spent that about it. You. I was a spender. I used to take my friends out because, you know, I'm a dancing queen. So we went to all the clubs. Yeah. Everybody had a good time. I was putting the bill, not re realizing that was a bad thing to do. So the mentorship for me and in coming into this community in 2018, um, my husband and I, we had the conversation. It's like we have money conversations, but it's not about the right way to use money, the right way to make it, how to grow the business. Since 2012, we were struggling to get our business going because I was grasping at straws and I wasn't hiring the people that could help me. I wasn't working around the community that could help me. And I get that now. You know, from 2018 till now, so much growth has happened. And it's because I have the mentor that I need. So... Well, I'm going to come back and ask a question. So I'll let you guys start thinking about it. Is what were some of the uh, lessons, like the rough ones and then the obvious ones um, learned by my mentors? Because in my experience, it was the rough ones. It was when Bob Proctor fired me after, I don't know, I'd paid him 25 grand. It was maybe four or five months into the year and uh, he fired me. So I'll come back to that story. So think through that as uh, we're going to share. Also, so Tamar, who was your first mentor? What was your first introduction to having a mentor? Because I don't think, you know, what drives me crazy about being an entrepreneur is, you know, you're not looking for an employer, right? And a lot of times, uh, and I brought, I'm glad you brought that up, Eileen, your employer is your mentor. They're your first guide. They're your first, I mean, look what you and I are doing with Shy right now. Right. He started his company, mm -hmm. by the way. He's going to collect money today on down. Yeah. So we're going to have a call with him next on the way to the airport. But I think, I mean, Eileen, I've been working with him for two, what, two weeks, maybe three weeks. Yeah. And we're, we're in our third week now. Right. Yeah. We're moving him straight to cash. But because he is an athlete, he has been coached. So I think that's probably another place to look is where you've had coaches might be where it might feel similar or what we're trying to convey to you, why it's so critical to have someone guide you and costly errors and access are my two big wins. What are yours tomorrow? First access. Well, <laughs> my big wins, costly errors. That is the story of my life. Now I was in drama, so I had directors that and they were my first mentors. You. Did you know that Thomas? Now we know about her. <laughs> I was a drama major at the university. I was a drama queen in high school. I we, do, we, we get all it. Of it. We, we, we get it. <laughs> I only went to law school so I could act and get paid for it. That is the only reason I became a lawyer, just That's so you know. Anyway, and so my mentors were the directors that I worked with, and they stayed my mentors for a very long time. And then I went into the academic side of things. And so my professors were my mentors. They didn't have any money conversations. <laughs> And then you get to law school and you get into practicing law. You don't ask for help. Yep. That was the like the biggest mistake of my last, the first 20 years of my practice. And even the last 20 years of my practice was that I didn't ask for help because that was not typical. cool. That's typical for women though. Women just. It is typical for women and it is typical for lawyers. So I, I got two things and that's why lawyers have such such a hard time mentally with the, you know, the, the, we will, won't talk about it. Anyway, my well, big I, mistake was though, when I left my law firm and I knew that I wanted to kind of coach and help people and help lawyers in their well-being, was that I went out and sought what I thought would be the kind of mentor where I needed. And that was somebody who could help me build a program. And I loaded, I loaded up money. I just spent money and it came to nothing. And he actually fired me. <laughs> He he did. He he yeah. refused to come down to a seminar that I had put together and um, said I didn't have enough people. And that was the end of it. That was 10 years ago. And I am 
still feeling, I, I still every so often just go, oh, get sick to my stomach thinking about it. So what now what? So what it happened? So what now what? A lot of you off, that, that had a bad experience, right? I have, we've all, I think we've all had, have we all had bad experiences? I mean, yeah. at some level and meaning with, with a group or, you know, you paid for something and it didn't work, really work out. You can't carry that forward. So really like take on this. So what now what? It was like, well, you, you know, you didn't know any better exactly. than the decision. And so now what? I say the same to everybody who holds their family hostage for their bad upbringing. You know, they did the best they could, whatever it is. So it is what it is. Grow up and move on and create from where you are and design your life from where you are. It's kind of how we think of, and coach you through 2020. So what now what? It's, it's, it is what it is. Uh, design your life anyway. Saddest thing about people that are saying no, they were burned by other coaches or whatever. And now they're saying no to somebody else. They're hurting themselves. Yeah. That's tough. I, I That's hard for me to swallow. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. When I look to that particular mentor, he had a team, but it was not the right team. And it it didn't feel right at the same time. And there wasn't a group of people that I could could rely on as well. So I mean, I've been, have had my eye on the big table since 2010, Laurel, and I'm kicking myself, you know, so what now what, but here I am. The important piece of that the lesson though, is that when you are looking for a mentor, especially a money mentor, you want to look for a group of people around the mentor. And I'll just say you, Laurel, uh, you, you the, the group of people that Laurel has surrounded herself with in the big table and at head of the table are people who are doing what Laurel has done. And they are putting into practice what Laurel has put into practice. And because of her mentors, what she's put into practice. And then you have, because I am more academic than anything else, you have your metric, you have your proof that this is the place you need to be. And my mistake, when I made that mistake that I'll never make again, is that I didn't look to the surrounding group of people that this mentor was attracting. Yeah. Chris, what about you? What was your first walk into having a mentor experiencing the power of a mentor? I got an interesting story of, of just serendipity over the years, I suppose, because I was always just open to new things. That's how I ended up in Bitcoin. I was like, well, that sounds unique. That sounds interesting. Let's play with it. Uh, actually, tomorrow I was in, I was an actor for just one year of my life. I can my totally senior year see of high that school. Too. That, well, the, the drama teacher came to me and asked if I would help sell tickets. And I was like, you want me to work <laughs> at the ticket booth? And she goes, no, silly. People will come to the show if you're in the show. And I was like, I don't want to be in plays. She goes, we'll put you in the back. And then I actually I took a class and I had to uh, audition for every play that year. And I made all of them. And I really enjoyed it. And it was a whole new world that it opened it up to. And that that beginnings was like, OK, I'm always never going to shut like the door tight. I'm always going to keep an open door to something new because you never know what it might uh, what, what you might experience. I even right. decided not to play lacrosse that year because I was in Les Mis and I was excited about being in my first music. <laughs> so I was terrible at singing. I'm not good at singing, but I'm funny. So I, I always got the funny roles. You uh, surround my, yourself with people who can sing and then you just mouth the words. Exactly. That's, That's what it. leadership really is. <laughs> My high school principal was probably my first like official mentor. And he followed me for a while because I, I ended up joining the fraternity in college that his son was a member of. And then I became the king of the frat boys, the, the president of the fraternity council at my college. And we needed a Greek advocate because some guys had had misbehaved years before and we had a unique relationship with the university. So we needed, quote unquote, an adult around to keep us a check. Uh, and he ended up being that adult. So I had eight years of him, actually. Uh, and he was a great mentor. Uh, but as far as business, probably not a lot came out of it. But it was more about just being a human being. And then my first business one was I came out of college at the fall of everything. So the, the houses are burning and Florida's over, like all the things that are going wrong in the economy. So there wasn't a lot of pickings for us kids at that time. Like it was the next generation wasn't leaving. Even if you had a master's degree, you were getting bitten. So I went, I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm not going to fight the grain. I'm going to try some entrepreneurial type thing. So I found a guy that was trying to build a company. And I said, I don't know a lot about business, uh, but I have a knack for just natural things. Can I come in board and just, and I came on as an intern and I left as his operating office, not officer, just operations director. Uh, and I learned the backbone of a business. I also learned what happens when you don't make action because he had analysis paralysis. I learned so much from him. I'm like a super nerd and can talk to my CTO and at a levels that I should never be able to talk about because I at where I'm at in my role. But because of the years I spent with him, I didn't make any money. It was kind of that was my sacrifice was I'm going to take uh, with it. There wasn't much salaries out there. 
and then the next was running into the guys that I work with now in financial services. And uh, my board is all 10 years older than me. Some are 12 or 15. So I'm the kid. They call me the baby CEO. There's been memes made about it. But yeah, like what I always try, try to find is like there's value in every mentorship you can find out there. But you have to remember that nobody's God. So nobody has all the answers. Nobody is right about everything all the time. And you will find differences of opinion. When I left the, the middle mo- mentor, it was a contentious departure for the two. Now we're best friends. And I call him all the time. He calls me all the time. He lives in Loveland and uh, Colorado, where I'm from originally. And, and so we chat. Uh, but there are times where it does get a little rough. Good mentorships can get through just like good friendships can get through good and bad times and maintain it for different reasons. That's my take on it. No, and I think that's so critical. And the other thing, too, is I've outgrown a lot of my mentors. You know, so I went through phases of and I think a lot of just people I'm going to say, but I am going to say more towards men. You don't want to outgrow your father. That is a weird sub- subconscious thing. I see it all the time. And then you don't want to outgrow your mentors. Um, but I remember, and I won't say them because they're pretty prominent men that are out there, but I financially way outgrew them. You know, they produce books, but I produce New York Times books. So then I'm in high media, high press. They didn't know anything about that. And these are people that are like big new name, like names from like, you know, they're infomercial guys, but they're not mainstream like Dr. Phil and the hell we went through. I mean, that was rigorous. I would have loved to have a big TV mentor at that time. And he, he became that because he knew that I didn't have anybody guiding me on how to do that and why to do it. And then what I decided, which is why not to do it, right? Which is TV is entertainment. It is not education. And that's just not where I land. And it's not where this community lands. It's not the results I wanted to produce. And I'll never forget the day he walked into a green room. And, he's, and I was so pissed because he wouldn't produce the, the executive producers wouldn't produce the results that we were creating. And I'll never forget the couple. They were making 20000 a month. And he said, you know, the, the, not him, but his, the team said that the American public will never believe that. Let's just say, it's, you know, six or eight. And they they actually walked out, weren't on the show. It's that one show. If you watch and you, you can't get it in sequence, it's hard to find. But they literally wouldn't go on the show that day. And I went on and then I walked off and then I didn't go back because I won't produce the truth. You know, there's just so much of that in the media anyway, which is probably why I don't like any of the media way before all this drama of the media goes on. There's just and then the other a story that's totally different. But I got to share this is there's a woman that was on the uh, the wife swap. And I said, I won't say her name, but I said, you're not even married. She said, oh, I know when I get to the show, I'll meet my husband. Anyway, so I just think all of TV and everything about that is just so odd. Uh, mentors, though, you you really got to get clear. Here's what I'd leave. Let's leave with some lessons. For me, the lesson was you can maintain. Um, I didn't know how to break up. Chris, to your point, that's kind of what triggered that thought. It became very contentious. I don't know how to break up anything. I'm terrible at it. I'm so bad at it. I probably have girls that still think they're dating me from college because I just don't know what to do. <laughs> so, and, and so you don't know how to like transition. That's probably right. And so even in our organization, like, you know, people that, you know, have worked for me, we had to come up with the word because they didn't quit. I mean, legally they quit and then they became a company. So we came up with the word graduated. Right. So a lot of times people will work for me as an employee because they're just not used to this becoming their own business. And after a year or two, then they graduate and now they have their own company and then their company works for my company. It's just it's a different relationship. So, you know, I think over time you're going to go through those phases. Uh, but I think as far as lessons learned, I'd say, number one, with lessons learned. I couldn't even imagine. First, I just got like my biggest lessons is costly errors and access. My God, some of the access I've been granted on the planet by other people's Rolodex is extraordinary. It's just been world class. I mean, I've had access to kings, queens, princes. You know, I need to go from here to here. I have a helicopter. I can take you in an hour. I need to go from here to here. I have a G5 jet. I'll take you in an hour. Like those access points to just moving on the planet, to getting what you need, access to capital, getting things done. I mean, most of you don't even know the basics about money, probably even to know what I'm talking about in that realm. So to me, it's costly errors and access. What do you got, you guys, best lessons of having a mentor and reasons why I couldn't even imagine operating with that one. I need that lifeline, somebody to call and check stuff out and make sure, am I on track? I'm leading a group of people. Like, am I doing the right stuff? I need that. You need that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that the actual lesson for me is you need to have the mentor because you're not going to figure it out on your own. And their wisdom and their experience will uh, compound your path to success much faster 
because not only will you avoid the mistakes they made, but you'll be able to improve upon the successes that they have. And so that's why, you know, we, we've had some people who are a little hesitant about joining the community, you know, just because of, you know, the nature of how long or how short they met you. And it's like that, you know, at this point it shouldn't matter because anytime you wait on holding anything up, it's an opportunity cost. And like Tamar and I, you know, both would have said, we wish we would have actually done our table experiences faster. Maybe there's just mm-hmm. that stubbornness piece of us that just thinks we have to do everything our own way but then you realize that there are other people out there that know it better and it's like you know put the ego at the door get in here get yourself checked and get working and then get your mentor you'll be good to go yeah mine was document oh i'm sorry tomorrow no go ahead ahead, chris i was just gonna say that but you say it document and not in a bad not like where your lawyer says document everything (laughs) there if you have a good if you have a good mentor you're going to have conversations with them that don't make sense at that moment in time. They're not going to apply to this solution that you're looking for, this problem you're dealing with. But it's three, six, nine months later, if, if, like I keep them fresh in mind because I'm weird and I can't forget anything. But I, I have legal pads that are labeled. My daughter laughs at them. She goes through and she's like, she thinks it's cool. She's like, yeah, this was six years ago. When you where were you at when you wrote this down? Just always have a notepad available, and not just for the scribbles because sometimes that happens, but also for just sometimes brilliance hits and you may not need it right then, but you could use it later. And if you're going to spend time, it's a symbiotic relationship. They're spending time with you, hopefully getting something out of you and vice versa. Because and now I'm, I'm evolving into the ment, ment, well, I guess mentor stage, not the mentee yeah. stage. I've been getting invited a lot for leadership programs and things mm-hmm. to take on kids or um, college graduates or et cetera. And it's, and you want, it's a two way street. I'm getting fulfilled out of it because I hope the kid succeeds and does something great. And, and I get to say I was, I, I knew him. That, that's, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Uh, so document, because you'll never know what you're going to want to go back to. And it's kind of fun sometimes. So critical. But I want to, I want to also put a big exclamation point on what you said. You know, I know I'm the mentor of many, but I have mentors too. And then here's, here's another one. And I was going to kind of wrap with this, but it's just the right time. I got to put it in is there's things that I look for to Chris, for example, who's an expert, but also a mentor for our community in, in digital currency. I know I'm, I'm going to use Tim Chris Fish because I'm on the way up to Boise for the, the holidays to spend with them and to look at a huge 390 acre ranch. And then you guys can all come and hang out on the dude ranch, just, you know, cattle, horses, the whole thing. Um, you know, we'll walk around and talk about things. Um, but the being mentored and being a mentor, I don't care what level you are, I think is critical. You know, like I know my son, he's only 21, but he has mentored a lot of younger kids. He has taught, you know, money at a teenage level at like Eric uh, Swanson's events for Habitude Warriors. He's in the he had wrote a leadership chapter at, I think, 15 years old. And I think it took him two weeks. It was like the scariest thing he ever did. And now he's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I wrote that. So to your point, Chris, document and go both ways. Be mentored always and have mentors. And always, always pay it forward. Like Eileen, I cannot wait till Shy gets uh, goes to the combine and where we're going to be spending Sundays watching, screaming for that, you know, exciting. watching him again and knowing that we helped him. We Black hole. Him. Yep. Yeah. So, so go ahead. So my biggest takeaway is um, for me personally, I had to become very clear on what it was I wanted men- mentorship on. And then I had to be coachable. Because I'm a person that thinks I can do it myself and get it done. Laurel and I had our little thing for several months <laughs> before I finally realized, well, wait a minute, I wanted the mentor. So why don't I listen to her? Right. <laughs> but throughout my mentorship with other people, that, that was one of my biggest things. I had to be very clear on what it was that I wanted, document everything. I'm a list maker. So I made a list of my questions. What am I looking for in a mentor? What do I want to learn? And how am I going to learn it? So being coachable is very, very key also for me. Yep, absolutely. Tamara, you can wrap us up. I have an ego the size of all outdoors. I am a lawyer. You cannot tell me anything. Have you figured that out yet? I, you can't tell me anything. It has to come up for myself. So what you want in a mentor is you want many mentors is actually what you want. And that's the great thing about this community is I don't just have one. I have a mentor for, I have Laurel, I have Thomas who helps me with marketing and I have Damon and I have, there are these people um, in this community that are generous with their time, generous with their ideas. And I feel like I'm surrounded by this huge family of mentors. And that to me is the, is for me the most important thing because I have so many thoughts that go bleh that 
being able to reach out and talk to someone about it who actually knows something about it has been invaluable to me. And usually it's Laurel because she knows everything. But <laughs> I think that is having that kind of uh, group around you is essential. So, I mean, I think that's just what's critical. And and again, I do have to say, you know, reaching back to where I learned the team thing was 1996, 97, 98. And it only lasted about three years, the Rich Dad Advisor Series. But I rem- I remember being a part of that. And I was like the lowest person on the totem pole and least experienced. Everyone was millionaires. I mean, we're talking Diane Kennedy, Dolph DeRuz, Garrett Sutton, all these awesome Keith Cunningham. And I'm just this young little youngster trying to keep up. I mean, I was like so stretched out at that time. But I will never forget when we started taking stages together as a team thinking, shit, this is the greatest idea. But the learning is everybody's got to stay in their lane and everybody gets to be great. And uh, when there's only one king in the kingdom, i.e. Kiyosaki, the rest of us had to go. So um, we've all stayed friends. We've had so much fun around it. Um, That's why Sharon and I stayed friends. But I really have to give creds to Blair Singer. I mean, that whole group, we had so much fun those few years. Um, it was like getting a PhD and you think about like with the water, like, you know, drinking from water hose for me. Oh, that was like nothing. I had that whole group. We were traveling around the country together, but the team thing is critical. And I'm glad you guys bring it up. Cause I think that is, I don't think I know this isn't just about me. I never think it's about me. Cause when you get to the table and I lean, you've been there before a little irritated. Sometimes I'm not there. There's pretty rare. I think there's only two tables in the history of tables I've missed because I'm in another country doing a table. And it wasn't because I blew you guys up, but I was somewhere else. And then we would zoom in. I remember having competitions from Australia back home. But my point is we have so many amazing brains and they they get the platform. They get business. Thomas gets to build you websites and he gets to be a coach and he gets to be here and he gets to stay in this. You know, there's just you've postured yourself well, I'd say that, Thomas. And a lot of folks have. You've really you get the breadth of it. Lileen gets tons of business. Her, she has a business inside the community. She's got a business outside the community. All right. Tomorrow's working her way into that. Chris, we're just adopting you. You know, we kind of have to. I'm, o- I'm open to it. I'm open to it. I know. Well, listen, you guys, we got to wrap. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Got some lessons. Um, before we leave, um, I've got to go uh, record with another big table, actually head of the table woman in New York. We'll be broadcasting on Friday. We're actually I know it's a holiday. But we're actually going to continue activity through the weekend. So I'm going to go record before we leave, though, if you guys could stay on here for a little moment. What are your lessons out there, those of you listening? I want to engage the uh, the chat. What's one thing that you have learned from a mentor and one thing you need to learn from a mentor? And uh, the team is brilliant and they can help you respond. But I want to engage how critical it is. And one thing to think about, like I already disclosed, I'm going to hire Dan Kennedy back next year. And I already, you know, uh, which Thomas, I don't know if he got that recorded. But what's cool about that group, because he is a marketing genius, is um, he lets me bring my team. So it's not just mentoring to me that I have to go home and transfer it to Thomas and Steve and whoever else we bring because it's, it's uh, well, there's a limit, but, you know, I can bring the whole team. We can do a whole plan. So um, I'm looking forward to that. So that's one of my mentors for 2021. I would hope we are going to be yours. What did you learn? Go ahead and put it in the chat. And what do you need in a mentor? Chris can't tell his last name. He's a secret weapon. Actually, Anita, you can text me because you're in the big table. I can tell you. <laughs> All right, you guys have witness protection. It's Bitcoin. It's it's Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin. (laughs) So, thank you guys. What do you got? A couple of folks who have said they've never had a mentor. Oh, you're about to change. So, so add into that for those of you engaged. Like, we don't need to to end this broadcast. I really want you guys to get this. It's critical. You will never be alone again when you get the power of a mentor. And which, but really, I make them family. I get them so close because it's Mm -hmm. critical. If you've never had a mentor, you need to at least think about our fast cash coaching calls. Yeah. You're trying to explain something to somebody who's never done something like that before. And once you have that experience, the light bulb should pop off. And you'll start saying, oh, wait a second. Here's a resource I have multiple times per week helping me with a lifelong problem that's going to be able to help me move me forward. And if you've never had that mentor thing before, you want to try it at some level. Fast cash would be a great resource for you all. We're just biased. You want to obviously use someone here in the community. Uh, but if you've never had a mentor, you definitely want to start using one. Um, and you don't have to necessarily be coy about it. Obviously, with Laurel's example about tracking down the bank president after a workout. Uh, but definitely the information, the wisdom that you'll get, it far outweighs the um, negative consequences of not working with one. 
and I'll just I'll just leave it in that. Right. And, and Rod says stuff. an interesting thing. Sorry, the, what, the one more important thing to, to say to that, though, is to Eileen's point, you have to be coachable because if you're not coachable, it's not going to mean anything. And you may think you're coachable. I'm sure Eileen thought she was coachable before she really got to the point where it, it, it broke through and understood what you need to do for growth. So I'll leave it at that. Any closing words? I know we're getting to the top of the hour here. I want to make sure we have a chance to, to let people close it out. I just want to say thank you. I always love being here with you guys. It's like my favorite part of every week. So thanks again for having me as always. Thank so you. Chris, Chris. People in the chat are saying, Chris, that you could play Superman. <laughs> well, we I do look very Superman. different without my glasses on. Like it, they, they, <laughs> very, they do change me quite a bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Thank Happy you Thanksgiving, all. Chris. You too. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Real Money Talks podcast. Your host has been Laurel Langmeyer, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View. Want to learn more about off-Wall Street investing, tax strategies, and multi-million dollar business strategies? Visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast for past episodes, show notes, and resources. For some special wealth building gifts only for Laurel's podcast listeners, visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast gifts. Do you have a burning question for Laurel? Visit asklaurel.com to submit your question, and it may just be covered on a podcast episode. So stay tuned and be sure to subscribe to get new episodes every week. Oh,